Hi, I'm Elon Weiner. I'm a customer engineering manager at Looker. And today I'm going to talk about data monetization. So all of our customers have a lot of data, but sometimes they come to us not knowing the best way to go to market with it. And the objective of this presentation is going to be to cover some proven strategies to monetize and generate revenue from your data. All along the way, I'm going to be covering a couple customer examples to highlight those strategies. So a study by McKinsey showed that data-driven organizations outperform their peers, and they do so by accomplishing higher customer acquisition, more value delivered to their customers, higher retention, and they're often more profitable. In fact, I want to show that even if you're not charging for data, it can help you generate more revenue for your business. So this is the journey that our customers are on in order to differentiate themselves in their markets. They need to put insights where their customers are, and that could be across multiple platforms, channels, devices, even personas. They often need to build value into their recommendations, which drive action. And of course, real-time information is becoming more and more essential. So all of these are the ingredients that will be part of a recipe that leads to higher value. And it's not necessarily something that needs to be accomplished day one, but you need to make sure that you choose an analytics stack that sets you up to get there. Okay, let's talk about Looker for a second. I'm sure most of you know that Looker has two primary product lines. There's internal analytics and embedded analytics, which is where our customers use Looker to share their data externally. And that could be via Looker, um, a, a dashboard, or it could be via a text message that's actually powered by a Looker endpoint. So some really quick numbers. Even though we only started offering embedded analytics in 2016, it now represents 30% of our new use cases and half of our daily active users. Unsurprisingly, it's also our largest use cases with 3.5 million users alone at Wix. Okay, let's get into the monetization strategies. So I'm gonna start off with indirect monetization. And again, what I really wanna make clear in this presentation is that you don't have to pass on the cost of analytics to your customers or charge them directly in order to monetize your data. So indirect monetization is a little less like traditional BI. It's very common in the B2B space. And what you'll find is that you're not generating CSVs or data dumps for your customers. It's really about enhancing your core product rather than creating a new product offering. So a lot of the companies that come to us see charging for analytics as a shortcut to monetization because they wanna pass on those costs but you can actually reap the rewards of analytics without charging for them by increasing your acquisition, your conversion, your retention, increasing brand recognition, and most importantly, proof of value. So here are a couple really well-known examples that you're probably familiar with. Dyson, for example, great proof of value with analytics. They build devices that filter air which is a pretty crowded space, but by giving their customers analytics on the quality of that air, they're constantly reminding them that their product works. For all you Spotify users out there, the year in review is a great way for Spotify to remind you of all the different types of music that they introduced you to over the year and give you detailed information about your favorite genres and listening patterns. People are competitive in business and in their personal lives. So one of my favorite examples is this Peloton example here, which became really popular during the pandemic as people weren't able to go into gyms or do their group classes. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you are still feeling that pain. So Peloton leverages data to keep their users engaged, to keep goals front and center, to let them know how they compare with others and to give real-time feedback. Another example actually from my personal life would be Robinhood. So this is an app that I have definitely used to buy stock and simply because they alerted me of a 5% dip in the price. Now, yes, I was probably following that company and interested in investing in it, but it was really the alert 
at the right time that help close the gap. And I've even tried to set up alerts like this myself on previous applications. Often they were just too difficult to set up for every single company I was following, or they very quickly became annoying and a nuisance. So that's just another example of putting data in front of users to help them drive decisions that makes the app far more engaging and really helps with user retention. So now I'm going to talk about the other strategy, which is probably more common, especially in the B2B space, which is direct monetization. Direct monetization is a lot easier to conceptualize. This is when you are passing the cost on to your customers and you're actually charging for access to data or data features and creating a separate revenue stream. So it's really common in the B2B space and it's been around for a while. Traditionally, it looked like raw data dumps and that worked for some people, but definitely not for most. There's now an expectation that you're offering be engaging and interactive because that allows insights to be available to more people and it reduces a lot of the friction that comes with a raw CSV, for example. A lot of the folks I speak to think that it's all about features and they're important, dashboards, filtering, alerting, scheduling, but it's definitely not the full story. In fact, the most powerful offering and the one that skews most towards a competitive advantage versus a competitive necessity is going to be packaged insights. Think about the actual data you're providing, specifically what insights are you offering your customers that are unique and that they won't be able to get from anyone else in the industry. So now that we've talked about indirect monetization and direct monetization, I want to talk about this pyramid or hierarchy that combines the two. People often think you have to do one or the other, and I would argue that even if your most valued customers are demanding a, a diamond tier experience with custom reports and on-premise infrastructure, there's still going to be value in offering analytics to the masses. And likewise, if you're offering free analytics to all of your users, there's going to be a subset of users who are willing to pay more for deeper insights. So I would think about it as a journey versus one or the other. Now, when you're trying to decide how to tier that information out and determine what offerings or what, what analytics belong to each offering, it's often most helpful to think about the insights first. So things like benchmarking and behavioral analytics are some of the most highly valued reports because they help your customers understand how they compare to their competition or how they can improve. Even within the same data set, there can be different tiers of value. You can give different access to granularities, whether that's monthly, weekly, daily, or you're splitting it up by product and category. Once customers realize value from churn analytics or benchmarking or cohorting, then there's a desire for automation and scheduling so that you can start to bundle features in with those tiers. Um, not only emailing to different users, but pushing data to different endpoints entirely like storage or different applications, even SMS. Drilling also becomes important. Why are we losing more customers this month than last month? Which SKUs are most impacted by that? At the diamond tier, being able to create reports for all of your customers isn't really possible. You can't always know what your customers want. So naturally, you want to give them the ability to create their own reports and ask their own questions. So let's talk about that path from indirect to direct monetization a little more. Um, take the example of a cryptocurrency platform like Coinbase. This screenshot shows how KPIs impact engagement. In this case, the user sees that 75% of all trading activity is in the buy direction. And that's a useful piece of information that could drive them to transact on Cardano. In this case, the insight itself, trading activity, is more valuable to Coinbase if they don't charge for it because it's driving transactions, which is their primary revenue source. Now, trading activity as a KPI could be more detailed. What if a customer wanted to understand trading activity by country or between countries, by risk score, or in real time? That's a deeper insight and it might only be available as a paid offering. So exposing the driving factors behind a KPI is likely something 
that only a subset of sophisticated customers will value and be willing to pay for. Here's some more examples of different ways you can think about tiering out your data offerings. Let's start with the good column. So in this offering, you might have a shorter time horizon. Maybe it's only six to 11 months worth of data. The data is likely aggregated and end users are probably limited to consuming reports versus creating reports. Then as these tiers advance, some of those time horizons expand. So 12 to 23 months or two years plus, users have access to drill into KPIs so they can actually answer follow-up questions. They unlock higher value reports like comparison against peers. In the mid and higher tiers, it's definitely common to give users the ability to create their own metrics and automate scheduling to sources like Dropbox or Google Drive, even Twilio or Slack so that they can take action on that data on other platforms. I want to use the rest of the presentation to cover a couple examples from our customers that highlight both indirect and direct monetization, as well as that tiered approach. So let's start by talking about Counta, which is an Australian POS service, very similar to companies like Square, but they offer much more than devices to process transactions. One of their key differentiators is the data they share back to customers, which is made available in tiers. So in the basic tier, you can download and export reports, you have mobile access, whereas in the advanced tier shown on this slide, you have real-time access, peer comparisons, benchmarking analytics, staffing and resource planning. Um, you can even build custom dashboards and get product sales insights. Another example with Drizzly, which is the largest online marketplace for alcohol delivery in North America, and they're actually acquired by Uber earlier this year, is that they created a new revenue stream by monetizing data for their suppliers. So these are companies who own a portfolio of alcohol brands. And the suppliers leverage this data to better manage distribution, inventory, demand forecasting, Drizzly actually used Looker internally first and was able to leverage a lot of these same reports and then distribute them to individual suppliers. So it's definitely a, a direct monetization strategy and the insights are cataloged by theme. So there's sales, compete, trends, and then within each theme, there's multiple reports, which are sorted by monetary value and attributed to the appropriate tier. So for example, Offline sales and market share is a report that's only going to be available to the platinum SKU. The last example I want to cover is Wix, which is a low-code, no-code website builder. And one of their key differentiators is premium analytics on the traffic, video, and e-commerce data collected from their website. They're at 3.5 million analytics users today, but they plan to scale to 80 different personas and 100 million users generating an average of 5,000 queries per minute. The challenge that they faced initially was rapid go-to-market and enormous scale. So the solution to that was embedding Looker dashboards to get a product out really fast, and that would support 100 million users, and then supplementing the out-of-the-box dashboards with Looker's API for more custom experiences. They have two key products or two key analytics products, which are visitor analytics and sales analytics. So who are your top paying customers? Where are you losing customers? And where's traffic coming from? Things like that. The learnings from this example are really that you should focus on volume and then fine tune along the way versus fishing for customers one by one to prove that the need to use analytics in your product. Also, notice that their data product is not a standalone product, but it's used to complement existing feature sets and services. For example, you're not subscribing to visitor analytics without getting more website creation capability like uh, storage and ad vouchers. The visitor analytics app and the site booster app are being used to differentiate premium tiers from the basic combo tier. By offering analytics for free for the first year, Wix is doing three things. They're differentiating their premium SKUs. They're recognizing that their analytics product will have a learning curve. So they're building in time for customers to appreciate its value. And the third thing is they're creating a standalone monetization path after that first year. 
As a final word, analytics has the ability to change your relationship with your customers from being transactional to consultative. And whether you're doing indirect monetization or direct monetization, you don't always have to charge for analytics in order to monetize them. That's all I have for everyone today, and I hope you enjoyed it.